Hey, Scott from Aristocob.com here. And Seth from Seth's House. Welcome to Mark of Men's Breakfast Club 2018. Hey! What, 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 do, what do you call this? This, this is season what? Uh, we, we call this uh, a Q2, I think, in business terms. Uh, this, this would be... <laughs> Really, this would probably be season two or three because we've we've not ever taken as long as a of a break. I, I don't think, as we did recently, we've taken some like month long breaks, but we weren't anticipating that. No, this wasn't a planned break. I mean, well, it was it, a planned. It, we we it said like two weeks. Well, we one said week, the last weeks, video yeah. that we recorded, which was what the, like the day after Christmas or something yeah. like that. Hey, we're not going to do another video for a couple of weeks, and then uh, <clears throat> life happened. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that, but first, let's smoke something. Can we smoke I would something? like to smoke something, and uh, I guess it gives us part of a segue into something that we want to talk about. When we la last left off, we had some folks that had told us that they had sent us tobacco for Tobacco Advent. We hadn't received their packages, or those packages mm -hmm. were somewhere between my move and his move. And so we have three packages, Woo! and we're going to use these in the tobacco contained within in upcoming episodes, and these three individuals will receive special bonus cornaments. Speaking of cornaments. Well, and speaking of the tobacco, we also still have tobacco unsmoked from uh, some of you who were generous and, and sent multiples yeah. that we will smoke. So we'll uh, use that through, through, this, well. through this yeah. year. This year. Uh, but uh, these three, sorry that you didn't make the deadline. Thank you very much, because I know that you all responded to some of our last-minute yeah. calls when we didn't think we were going to make it to the deadline. So thank you so much. So we're going to start with this package, because it's nice and shiny and pretty. And uh, we will move on to those others in weeks to come. If you recognize your package there, we will get to it. Thank you for sending this along. Now, I have a special pipe I'm going to smoke in today. Do you have a pipe chosen? I have a pipe. Uh, it is special because it is the pipe in which I shall smoke. Right, that's, that I is mean, special. isn't isn't the special pipe the pipe that you're smoking in? Whatever whatever pipe you have on in your face hole. That's right. All right, so this one's got a couple tobaccos inside of it and a note. Ooh. So why don't you read the note in, in case as I do in case he's saying, "Hey, whatever you do, don't say my name." <laughs> Okay, you got that? Yes! Alright. I'm going to take a picture of the uh, dress here. So this is from Steve, the Southern Experience. It says, hello Scott and Seth, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thanks Steve. Thank you Steve. Thanks for putting on tobacco advent each year. Both of these blends are made by Eric Smokes a Pipe from YouTube. They are non-cased aromatics. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Okay, so we have peppermint mocha, and I'm not sure what that says. Briar Maria? Briar Maria blend, blend number, number one. one. So just by name, which of those sounds? Peppermint good? Mocha, because... Alright, so we'll put this in for a future smoke. I like and your knife. It's the, it's the knife I've I, You know what? I don't have that one. <laughs> I, I have 40 of those, and I don't think I have any with the rubberized Oh, grip. okay. Alright, that's peppermint, and it's mocha. I'm going to smoke this in... Ooh. Have you seen these in person yet? I don't know what that is, so no. <laughs> this is the um, the latest it's rendition like of the reverse calabash. The no. Chris Morgan design. Uh -huh. The first version was a cob wasp. And check this out. So it's got it's got Whoa. a picture of the old building of Missouri Mearsham. It's got a certificate of authenticity, and in addition to that, there's instructions, care and feeding instructions. And then this <laughs> this particular version happens to be a two tone wow. pipe. Okay, That's so, swanky. Yeah. It's kind of mean of me to smoke this because the two tones are long gone. No uh, one no one can have them now. Oh, that's um, real mean. I think we still have some of the single, um, whatever we want to call this, the natural or polished yeah. color. Were those a limited run? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, limited run and, and hand numbered. See? Cool. Same number as on the certificate. That, that took that, some coordinating. That's good, yeah. <laughs> But um, just like the original one, it smokes great. It's got a calabash uh, section here. And what, what they did change here is they changed the way this plug worked. 
I don't know if you remember, the old one was a, an actual button like they use in woodworking, like mm -hmm. the eyeball of our rocking horse. Right. That they drilled out and put the bit into, and it it was a it was very shallow how far it engaged, and it didn't have much of a taper to it, and so some folks had trouble with it. Well, this it's got a, a really nice long taper, and it fits almost like mm. what they call a military fit, mm -hmm. but they do still recommend not to to clench this, not to let it hang mm. from your face hole. Yeah, that would not. You don't want to fall. Survive a fall. I don't. Ooh, I like that. The, the peppermint. Yes. All right. Cool. I'm, I mean, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not into it very far, but uh, there's there's the there's definitely a cooling sensation from the peppermint. So which when, is sweet. When you smoke a peppermint patty, you get the cool sensation. That's a decent looking smoke too. Mm. All right. I like so, that. For this episode, we decided that since it has been such a long time, that we would uh, just kind of talk about what's been going on, catch up, and uh, beginning next week, maybe get a little bit more focused on what we're talking about. But um, what you been up to, boy? Tell them. <coughs> well, so uh, part of what, what has kept us away so long is... We both moved into new homes. Um, at the end of the year, Homer and, and uh, the family moved into a new house, and we moved um, close to the end of January into their old house. And so that was significant, and you know, we still haven't managed to get everything unpacked and get settled in um, into the new, the new home. And in the midst of all of that, I've been doing some traveling. I was in Phoenix, Arizona last week. I will be in Phoenix, Arizona this upcoming week. Um, uh, we've talked about it in the past. There are just tends to be, I guess it's just a good place for industry um, at the times of year that the uh, trade shows in my industry uh, like to, to meet. They, they tend to meet early in the year and late in the year. And so it's a good place for that. Um, and so, I've been doing some traveling through work. Work is good. Kids are good. Um, everyone has been sick. I've had about six weeks of various germs being passed <laughs> around in, in Markwood House. Um, Not just in the house. No. And so we, we yeah, I, I managed to get sick in, in Phoenix last week, and it's been a whole week traveling uh, uh, sick, and it was not fun. What a horrible experience. I had that yeah. happen one time where I was down in uh, Houston supposed to be traveling with a rep and I arrived and the night that I arrived I wasn't feeling very well so I called the guy up and said hey I'm in town I'm at the hotel maybe we get a late start mm. well we never did get a start mm. um, I was I was in bad bad shape and that's <coughs> on the one hand it's nice <coughs> that you can kind of camp out and you don't have any any interruptions except for maybe maybe if you forget to put the do not disturb sign right but uh, there's no place like home when it, when it comes if you're not feeling well. Why do you feel terrible about it, too, from the business standpoint? I mean, we were there for a trade show, and I ended up having to wimp out for some of the, the social events that I would normally attend. Uh, you know, I just I couldn't pull through. Um, the actual trade show floor one afternoon, I had to, to wimp out and stay in my room while my coworker went um, by himself and manned the booth. And so I hated that for him. I hated it for the company. I feel like I wasn't able to give the company uh, their full value for the trip, um, you know. But thankfully, they understand that those things happen. It's unavoidable, yeah. and you just uh, hope it doesn't happen again. So, um, because of that, because of just how busy we've been, kind of running around, um, and we had had just front loaded so many videos in December. Um, there's been just a little bit of a. Uh, uh, a lull and, and kind of a hesitancy, I think, to, to jump back into filming videos um, just because it, it's a time commitment. It's a, um, Once we start, we know that we're going to want to keep going with the weekly videos, and, and so that's a, it's a big commitment. And so it was kind of nice to have some time to, to be pulled back a little bit and not have to 
worry about oh it's Tuesday night gotta gotta edit and upload that that, that next video or you know I've, I've mentioned on several occasions that right after we record tobacco advent or right after I do something like the International Corn Cop Pipe Month video contest where I'm putting out a video or two every week for a month that I just feel so overexposed. Yeah. I just, it's not that I feel like, oh, I've said everything there is to be said because we passed that about four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you just, you just don't feel it sometimes, you know? Um, well, and, and I think too, I think YouTube is a difficult medium for situations like ours where um, I know you're you're active on some other forms of social media. I'm not really, yeah. and so on YouTube, you know, there, there's not really a good forum, a good place for people to say, "Hey, I miss you." Uh, you know, when you coming back? You're doing videos, whatever. And so we didn't get much of that. Um, and you know, it, it's it's easy to feel just because it is with the exception of a video to video kind of relationship it's it's oftentimes feels one way uh one direction that's easy to feel like you know if we don't come back uh <laughs> who's gonna yeah, miss yeah. yeah yeah but i know you you mentioned you got some comments on i did it's funny because i've had comments on every varying social media from um facebook i'm active on facebook at facebook.com forward slash aristocob you're welcome to be my friend, but I at, at, at Scott E. Markwood, I don't really do anything there. I'll, I'll accept your friendship, but um, where I am active is there on the Aristocop page. Um, I'm active on Instagram, probably more than anywhere else I'm active on Instagram. I dabble a little bit in Twitter, not much. Um, but mostly looking at what other folks post. Consuming and, and, more than Yeah, and occasionally leaving a comment here or there. Um, and it, well, they're <coughs> totally insignificant places, but all of those as Aristocob, a couple other names too, where it doesn't fit the pipe world, right? right? You know, um, but that's that's basically it. And but in the number of those places, I've had folks comment about, "Hey, where's uh, where's Mark Levin's Breakfast Club been? You guys okay?" Mm. And that was nice. But I, I will say, what's what was a weird revelation years ago on YouTube and continues to surprise me every time I'm made aware of it is it is one in 200 new subscribers on YouTube that I see leaving a comment on an old video and then leaving a comment on an mm. old video and then leaving a comment on the old video. More times than not somebody discovers us or, or Aristocop, watches a video, says hey that's great you got my sub, and then they wait for something to happen. Yeah. And I I don't know if that's just an old habit from watching television. I don't know. But you think with like um, Netflix, we've gotten used to binge watching that people would binge watch on YouTube. I'll, I'll tell you, our best content was long before today. Yeah. Four years ago. <laughs> I hope that's not true. But there's there's been some really good episodes of Mark and Ben's Breakfast Club yeah. that make me laugh anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So what about you? What have you been up to? Mm. First off, let me agree with you on this tobacco. This is really interesting. I like it. And you're getting that that mint, that cool mint. That's really cool. It's 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 mellowed out a little bit as I've as I've smoked it. I don't know if it has burned off or I don't know what was what is causing that, but I quite enjoy it. I'm getting it still yeah. still. Um, a lot of travel with work. Um, I've been in Orlando twice. I was in LA once and I'm going back in just a couple weeks. Um, I'm even forgetting places I've been. Where have I been? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that and moving. And also, um, the, my employer all of last year, they were in the process of rebuilding our corporate offices, and so they took from me my training center, which is in a separate building, but they took it away because they needed the room for conferences. 
in, in meetings, which is why I ended up doing more training out in California. I had right. space out there that I could use. Um, well, now I've gotten, now that the, the new construction is finished, I got my old space back, but we're moving things back in. So a third of what I had in this room that had been in there and, and accumulating for about 10 years, a third of it was thrown away. A third of it was put in storage in North Carolina, and about a third of it was shipped out to California. Wow. So I'm getting that now back into the space, trying to um, to merge together the things that have, again, begun to accumulate in the meantime. And then I'm going out to L.A. in a couple weeks, in part, to start shipping some things back. <coughs> I'm going to leave, I decided I'm going to leave some things out there because... If it turns out, I'm a tr corporate trainer for a furniture and cabinet hardware company. Mm -hmm. And if the numbers make sense, if half of my group who's attending a class is from the West Coast, we'll go ahead and do the class out there in L.A. again. No reason not to. Uh, so I'm not going to ship everything back. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I, I purchased a very large um, tool, roll-around uh, tool chest from Harbor Freight. And it's filled with tools, and it's ready to, for lots of hands-on training. Yep. I'm not shipping that back. I already have one of those here. Yeah. So. But, um, and again, trying to, uh, trying to deal with just getting all the crap in place in, in all the places. So everywhere I turn around, I feel like I'm just disorganized and almost want to just throw it lighter at it and walk away you know yeah. and there's definitely some advantages to that yeah. like the third of the stuff I threw away right it hurt to do that yeah. but I miss very little of it well I think I think that that's a challenge that we've run into both of us with moving is when you move you, you the things that you prioritize getting set up first are the things that you really need yeah and everything else sits in boxes in your way until you do something with them or they just don't get moved um and so you know it, it it then makes it a significant chore to go through that last 10 percent or 20 percent of stuff do you catch yourself saying i need to spend money on a better way to store this no <laughs> no uh i mean no well, you're more disciplined than i am yeah thankfully we've developed the uh a just pitch it mentality. The hardest, you know, the hardest thing for me to develop that mentality for. Allie challenged me and, and pushed me towards this. Is you books. were raised by me. Is is well, I mean, I, I still have it with some things, certain things, but but books um, because you know I have a, a huge. I've accumulated hundreds of books um, in seminary and and before that, um, just lots of books, expensive books, and um, she read a like feng shui kind of book about if if something doesn't bring you happiness and joy if it hasn't brought you joy in the last six months get rid of it because it, you don't need it and um and you know about books the point this this author made is do we have to exclude relatives yeah uh i think there's something about that in the law i'm not sure um <laughs> you know about about books it says if, if there's if there isn't something in there that you can't find some other way, get rid of it. There's not a single book that I have, even my my biblical commentaries and these really big expensive books that I haven't opened in eight years. There's not a, that that it hurts to get rid of. You know that's a sunk cost fallacy that we've talked about before. Um, there's nothing in there that I can't get with a Google search, no. which means every time I need that information. I'm going to go to Google. I'm not going to dig out the book, which is why the book has been sitting in a closet for eight years. And so, at that point, why am I keeping it? So, do you sell them? What do you do with those things? For me, honestly, there's so much that I just get rid of it. Just goodwill, just take it. I don't, I don't want to deal with it. I know that there's potential profitability that I'm giving away when I do that, but what that does is that's another headache. More, more work. That's more work, and that makes it more likely that I'm just going to sit on it and not get rid of yeah. it. It's easier to just load the box into the car, take it to Goodwill, let somebody else who will, will find joy in it have it. It's I'm not I'm not losing any more money 
by not selling it than I am by keeping it in the closet for eight years. Has, to my knowledge, this hasn't happened. Yet. <coughs> but one of these days, I'm going to call you from Goodwill and say, you're not going to believe what I just found for mm -hmm. 50 cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a box of books. A box of books. Anyway, that's, that's really the bulk of what's been going on. Uh, it's not all that exciting. Um, Aristocob.com has been exciting and in some ways not good. Um, we had this, this huge outage of pipes and Missouri Mearsham was having issues with all of their higher end imported bits or stems. Um, they come from Italy and they couldn't get them. And to this day, there's still several of the shapes that they're kind of metering out. We got a few more, we can fulfill that part of your order. Mm. Wow. And, and then not even just those, some of the other shapes too. And, and I have no doubt that the, the production of this pipe had to pull some people off of the assembly line making right. some of their normal pipes. And I can't necessarily blame them for prioritizing. This is a $50 pipe. Mm -hmm. You know, how much time do you spend making a Morgan nose warmer when you can make this and get 50 bucks right. out of it? But that explains in part why we haven't shipped out the cornaments yet. Mm -hmm. And I just sent a message to somebody guaranteeing that you will have them in time for Christmas. That's our promise to you. <coughs> yeah. We apologize. We, we just got them in. Jandy, okay. Jandy tells me we just got okay. the neck and nose warmers in. So Excellent. hopefully we can get those turned around quickly. Okay. But that's been very, very frustrating because yeah. I hate... I hate that I'm feeling frustration that I'm venting towards my supplier, but in turn I'm I'm expecting my customer to be patient, right? And I can't expect them to be any more patient than I am, right? And I, I get it that somebody can't get their you know five dollar Morgan nose warmer, and that they're gonna you know they want to cancel the order, get their money back. I can't blame them, right? At the same time, it's maddening for me to have an order that I know is sitting in Missouri and has been there for weeks, if not months, and for one reason or another, it's not being produced. So, it's, uh, it's catch-22. The ones I really, really hurt for are those folks that expected the gift of some sort. And we had lots of folks that re reached out to us and we said, look, let me tell you what we have on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. We have thousands and thousands of pipes, but it seems to be the attention seems to go towards a particular style. I don't know why. Um, it's it like the popular ones are popular or something. I think it is the popular ones that are yeah. popular. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's frustrating. Um, and you do what you can for your customer and hope that they, hope that they understand. And It's been funny watching the, the forums, though, with this pipe because this was announced Missouri Marisham threw some pictures out on Facebook and, and said it was coming it had been rumored that it was coming um, and then the the price of it went out there and we're like you know 50 bucks for a corn cob pipe count me out who would spend 50 bucks for a corn cob pipe you know um, dang it his name has just escaped me um, out in Sioux Falls Anyway, um, Jeremy Larson took his old reverse calabash, his Missouri Mirisham reverse calabash that Chris Morgan designed, stuck it out on eBay, and got a hundred and I want to say sixty-five dollars for it. Okay, he paid exactly the same price that these were selling for new, right. but because of the rarity of it, somebody wanted it, he had it, they they bought it up. So you know. I can't, you know, past, past performance is not indicative of future results, but you don't know. Um, right. And the fact that we instantly sold out of the two-tone and then almost immediately sold out of the single dark, solid color dark, yep. and then now we're sitting on just a couple of the other. Um, plenty of people want them. They smoke, yep. they smoke really well. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's yeah, just it's, this weird thing. There's because there's a chamber here. When you puff on it, it's there's a millisecond where the smoke doesn't hit your mouth, and you're used to that instantaneous. Uh, it's almost like you're smoking out of a long pipe, but you're not. Right. 
and uh, that's interesting to me that that's yeah. the case. Huh. And it cools it off, and it drops off a bit of moisture, and yeah. it helps. There's, uh, I mean, what you're talking about there is the, the principle of scarcity, which is just a, a fascinating um, sociological phenomenon. That now, what's what's interesting about it? Uh, if you ever get a chance to read Robert Cialdini's book Influence, it's is all it about, in your library? Uh, it, it is on my shelf at work. It is one that I will not be getting rid of. Because it's one that I refer to. It, it, this is this is a book that that is uh, the foundation for the two day class I took in in Phoenix a year and a half ago. Um, the uh, one of the the principles of persuasion is scarcity. That our brains want things that are scarce, um, and there are ways that businesses will use this principle uh, to convince us that something is is good. So, um, they, there are examples where they've taken, um, uh, they went to a, a cupcake place and they had, they had a tray of cupcakes. Well, when the tray is full, nobody wants to buy them. No one, no one wants to take one because it looks like no one has taken one and nobody wants to be the first person to mess up the array. When there are three cupcakes left in the shelf, everybody wants those cupcakes. Uh, they did these studies with cookies there's where they... one nobody wants it, though. That happens. Right. They did these studies where they they had a, a, a bowl of candy sitting in a room as they were asking um, a student or somebody questions, a, 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 the person they were studying. They would ask them some questions, and they'd have the candy in the room, the dish, and, and they didn't want any. Um, and then somebody would, uh, would come in and they would um, say, uh, hey, can I take this? We've got more people out uh, in the room next door that would like some. Would you like any before I go? They, of course, grab some. They take the bowl out and they bring it back. Well, then in a different study, they would bring the bowl back and then they would come back five minutes later and say that uh, actually there are more people and uh, or that they're not gonna, or that they would come, that when they came back, rather, they said, hey, um, they're about to finish this off. I wanted to make sure you got all that you wanted. Would you like some more? <laughs> and so there are all these examples so the of people paying. The more scarce it felt, the more they, they wanted it. Right. But there are all these examples of people paying outrageous amounts for food, in particular, um, like uh, a cookie shop that was shutting down, was closing down, and people were paying $100 for their last batch of cookies. Um, mm -hmm. But what these studies have found, that with food at least, uh, even though the scarcity makes you want it more, when they do tests of how it tastes, there's no difference in taste. So that's that's the experience. Gee, really? <laughs> well, I mean, you would think you think would you'd you would really think find that. It amazing, huh? Yeah. So you know, the experience of having it isn't increased all that much by the scarcity of wanting it. So like when we travel to Ohio and we suddenly have access to Marion's Pizza, you're saying that that Marion's Pizza doesn't taste better? Yeah. It tastes like it has always tasted. It tastes <laughs> amazing. It tastes to you the same way it tastes to everybody who lives in Ohio. Yeah. Only more rare. Speaking of rare, we have something to talk with to you about in our next episode. So be sure to join us next week on Mark and Ben's Breakfast Club. <laughs> Thanks. We'll see I, you. I just, just thought I'd uh, throw an ending in there. Yeah, it was very uh, PBS. <laughs> this video is supported by viewers like you. Not exactly like you. <laughs> Make it a great week. We'll Thanks. see you next week. See ya.